Okrama Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Jamini. Joining me today is economist from the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa, or ACBIS, Wande Lesishlobo, to discuss his book titled A Country of Two Agricultures, The Desperities, The Challenges, The Solutions. So, Mr. Slobo, in your most recent uh, book, you argue that uh, there are two agricultures uh, in our country. What are the features of these two agricultures? The book, uh, as its title says, A Country of Two Agricultures. The two agricultures that the book talks about is in, is in, is in perhaps maybe in two ways. Firstly, is of course the fact that we still have a dualistic agricultural sector in South Africa one that is commercial and largely white and then we have a smallholder farming side that is predominantly black but we also have another dualism in this which is the geographical one because if you look at the provinces that had the former homelands of south africa they still somehow at the periphery of agricultural progress while some of the provinces that from the olden days already had a lot of vibrant agricultural sector. They have over time progressed far more than those that were in the former homeland. So you can look at it in a geographical perspective. By that, I mean the Eastern Cape, parts of KZN and Lipopo, uh, you see them slightly lagging, particularly the former Transkei. While then, if you were to look at the other regions of South Africa, you see them progressing. And of course, the racial dynamics um, that are in the, in terms of commercial and smallholders older farmers. And by that, I mean, you you yourself probably you see the numbers. Uh, black farmers in South Africa still make up less than 10% of the commercial output that we have. So that's the dualism at which the book points to that is still persist uh, today. Mm. And in your first chapter, you say that land reform and inefficient uh, financial government support systems have entrenched a divide between what we've just mentioned, the commercial farmers, and then the subsistence farming, which is predominantly black farmers. How can our government rectify this issue? We, we're now having this conversation, year 2023. And you and I remember back in 2020, when I released the first book, which was Finding Common Ground. It looked specifically on the issues of land. Um, in, at the time, we were discussing expropriation without compensation and the other aspects. And then we're talking about how to go forward with land reform. Uh, but in this particular book, we are dealing more with both the dualism issue, but also a question of saying, how do you grow the South African agricultural pie? And land reform is part and parcel of that, but and other issues that are there. Because as we talk today, the South African government is sitting, for example, with roughly 2.5 million hectares of land in its agricultural land holding account. The question then is about how do we effectively transfer to black beneficiaries that are properly selected and of course that will be able to use that land for good agricultural production but land reform alone is not going to cut it you have to think about the incubation of the skills access to finance infrastructure institutions that are supporting that which is that learning and the experience that is needed for that so it's a combination of things but of course we centered also the commentary around our land reform so if we can progress on those aspects i think we can be able to see some commercialization of black farmers so that we're no longer talking about roughly less than 10 percent of commercial output but rather more robust uh, figures you also paint a bleak picture when you discuss what is hindering now black farmers to progress in the agricultural sector. And one of these reasons is the fact that building critical infrastructure has been slow in our country. And you, you've made an example in the book of the Brand Flay Dam. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, the point here is that uh, when you're dealing with the agricultural sector, you're not only talking about the aspects of land and production, but also infrastructure. And infrastructure, you're thinking about the dams. We made the, the, the example of a, of a brand flight dam in, in a Western Cape, which was delayed uh, for a couple of years. But the point here that I'm trying to lift, and I make an example in the book where I point, particularly the Eastern Cape, the Transkei area, where I'm saying, look, there's all of this underutilized land, which even if it were to come into full production, there could be financing, but we need infrastructure. Infrastructure is in a couple of things. It could be dams, it is roads, it is silos, 
it is on-farm infrastructure. Those are all of the things that we need to actually see agriculture progressing in South Africa. But I think we have broader problems than that. Some of the problems that we have have a lot to do with in municipalities that are not functioning properly in South Africa. And agriculture thrives or exists in rural towns. And if you are a new entrant farmer, would not even have the capital then. That means that those infrastructure blockages that are there, they increase your transaction costs and further isolate you from the formal channels, which is why I was thinking the aspects of infrastructure is very important if we are to thinking about the commercialization and the growth of the agricultural sector to a scale at which it can be viable and give us the employment that we so badly need. Now, talking about the, the department and, and in some cases, is um, municipalities not effectively uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Do you think this could be maybe partly blamed for what we've had uh, being thrown at by the DA to the ANC, the, the issue of cater deployment, that some people are in the positions and they don't even know what they are doing? I mean, I think this is a combination of the issues, and I will not even delve in uh, deeper on what's the issue because I want the readers also to enjoy the book and figure out what we, we say there. But I mean, the point is uh, a skill is part and parcel of, of, of that know-how of what to do, but also the level of dedication and to what people need to do is part of that. So you have the capacity capability problem that is there. But I th do think that also there is something to be said about making sure that there is a consistent message that comes from Pretoria to provinces and to the long because there is a, a bit of coordination improvement that is needed on that. Most of the time, we spend a lot of time talking to Pretoria. Take, for example, the Department of Agriculture. They talk about the master plan, what they plan to do, and all of those things. The question then is, are we communicating that correctly to the provincial and the municipality level? Because the actual business activity happens at a local level, not in Pretoria where we discuss the, the, the politics. It then come in a way to what you are saying about the municipalities. The municipalities have to be run properly by people that understand and know what they have to do, but also driven to actually see improvement in the communities that they, they have. So far in South Africa, particularly over the past decade, we have seen really drastic decline in the performance of some of these municipalities. In the book, I make example of the issue of the Northwest in Lichtenberg, the Clover situation, which I highlight, and some of the other issues that are happening in Pumalanga and some in the Eastern Cape. So a number of municipalities are poorly performing, and these are weighing on the rural growth and the agribusinesses in South Africa. So it is a both of a capability and a capacity, and the political orientation is part and parcel of that. Mm. And now, how can our government tackle the issue of dualism uh, in this sector? And can you also explain the role that uh, can be played by the white farmers in supporting government's efforts to boost the, the inclusion of black farmers in the sector? I mean, uh, so there, there, there's a number of things that, that they can do, which is why I was saying, even on writing um, on the preface of the book, that the book is concerned not only about looking into history, it does look mm -hmm. in history because history provides an important context of how we got to be where we are today. But there's a lot more work that has been done on that question. The only contribution that I could make was on thinking about the solution oriented. And as you see from moving from part one in the book, it goes all the way to part 12, 11. When you get to part 11, it all brings together where you see some of those solutions where we are thinking about, okay, going forward, what needs to be done on land reform? What improvement that needs to be done on agricultural finance? Because agricultural finance is something we've been discussed a lot. What needs to be done on incubation and training of the new uh, farmers that are coming in? The release of the land, what form of that release? Lease of land should actually be, be happening. Improvements that are needed in the institutions within government, either on registering new chemicals, genetics, but also moving then towards the hard infrastructure that is needed to see the agricultural sector growing. So those are some of the menu on a part and parcel of the issues that are, are in the book highlighted that are essential for seeing the agricultural sector growing. But I also make the point that we, we actually have to embrace the concept of better few, but better. 
commercial farmers because now the idea of thinking that we can get as many black farmers into agriculture as possible it may be a noble on something that we like but we have to appreciate the fact that not everyone will be um, a farmer and we have to be creating a new class of commercial black farmers so that we close the dualism while at the same time still supporting small hold farmers that is, that is needed in there and in that as you rightly saying government has a role to play and the private sector has a role to play and it is not all bad because we've seen examples which are highlighted in the book such as the sonic group in the central free state with the pals in the western cape and we have many others and then the book grapples with those and learning what are the commonalities that are leading to success and how can we then make sure that these things are shared and done in a wider scale at a national level. But then you don't seem to be hopeful that uh, proposals for agricultural reform will gain sufficient buy-in from all stakeholders because of our history. Tell us about that. No, I mean, I am hopeful that you will. The only thing that I'm raising in the book, really, there's a chapter in here which deals with the political economy of agriculture which is the fact that, I mean, we usually think that, oh, it's private sector and government, as if private sector, we are all a little nice family, we agree on what we say, but we don't. If you look at the private sector agriculture in South Africa, we're still grouped in certain groupings that you see here. Some of them even resemble the racial dynamics of the history of South Africa. The idea then is to say, how do we form a much more unanimous united farming association in South Africa? Africa. I know we won't in the near term have a united group of farmers association because interests and needs are different and, and their alignment, but we can align in a broader level so that there is a one private sector view, which then assists in working with the government on establishing some of the big picture themes of the policy. Because if we are too fragmented, then this leads to an environment where the government doesn't really know who to listen to. So those are some of the things that we have to, 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 to grapple with. And the book in the chapter, The Political Economy of Agriculture, takes the reader inside the sector to actually have a deeper appreciation of the politics that do exist and their implication on efficiency of the policies that then end up uh, being proposed in South Africa. So that's the aspect at which it comes from. But broadly thinking about whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about South African agriculture, I'm very optimistic that today and looking at around about maybe 2030, the numbers are out there from BFEP, the Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy, which makes the point that we can see the cross value added in South Africa's agriculture expanding by anything between 15 and 30 percent over the next decade or eight years or so. But for that to happen, there are certain prerequisites that needs to be in place. And those are the issues that I was talking about, transfer of land, availability of finance, infrastructure that is needed, municipalities that are working training and the incubation for new entrance farmers. Those are all part and parcel of the aspects that needs to be done. But the book also does a great deal of work on focusing on trade. And I would say half of the book really delves in and talks about the issues of that. And one of the reviewers, Professor Nick Fink, made the point that the strength of the book is really around this aspect of trade, where we're looking at it, South Africa's agricultural position in the world, in Africa, in BRICS, really thinking about that and what should we be improving going forward. And uh, in the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that a uh, government is still um, holding on to a lot of land. What would you say uh, if I were to ask you if do you think our government has failed now to, to redistribute this land and to black people in our country over the past 30 years? And what does the data tell us? I mean, look, the book, as I say, I, I, I'm interested in a forward looking. Here now, we have the problems. The question is to say, how do we move forward? And how we're moving forward is where now we are, the book suggests a, a couple of points about how do we release this land with title deeds, with long term tradable leases to the new beneficiaries going forward. And I think that idea, yes, is in the book. I mean, the book has been read by ministers and many other leaders of our sector in the DGs, and they, they are taking to heart the central message of the book. And they do agree that there's something that we need to do with the release of the land anchored with some of the suggestions that the book puts forward so that we are able to see the growth of the sector. There are missteps that had happened in the past, but I think to your question, what now we are focusing on is 
the forward looking solutions about how to drive land reform as we grow the agricultural sector and on the issue now which is a, a hot topic uh, now these days is the issue of the uh, african continental free trade uh, you say that our country should rather focus on expanding export markets in critical uh, growing regions like china and saudi arabia why is that right now yes africa is the biggest market for south africa uh, 40 percent of our agricultural exports go to the continent but 90 cents in every one south african rent that we're putting out um out there in the world really comes from SADC. It's only 10 cents that comes from other regions. But when you look at the infrastructure constraints, you look at the consumer taste in some of these countries, economic prospects, the type of products that South Africa puts out in the world, and what is demanded by some of these regions in the African continent, we see a lot of misalignment. But there's also something that is beyond that, which has a lot to do with the harmonization of the standards of the products and the use of genetics. For example, in Kenya, it could be an important market for South Africa for exporting grains, but Kenya doesn't import genetically modified maize. South Africa produces 85% genetically modified maize. I'm making that as an example, but other aspects Aspects are the ones that I have highlighted. To an extent that when we look at this, where we see exports growing from a South Africa perspective, it's really the markets within the BRICS plus. If you think about China, you think about India, you think about Saudi Arabia, and then even beyond that, the Bangladeshes of this world, Japan expanding further in the US, maintaining the EU um, and maintaining the UK and opening up and maintaining the Americas. Those are some of the interesting markets that I think South Africa has a lot more to gain on that. And I think when the reader engages with the book, they'll get to have a deeper appreciation of some of these aspects, because what we do in the trade chapter, we look at the South Africa, Africa agricultural trade as it is, we look at the optimism that people have painted. We look at some of the uh, barriers that do exist. And that in totality is what brings us to the suggestion that we put at the end of that chapter on trade about how we are thinking about this and where are the growth. And the exports in South Africa's agriculture is very important because right now we are exporting about half of what we produce in value terms. And if the, the expansion in production that I was talking about were to materialize, then that means that we have to have much more export markets at which we will send these products to, which is why the story of trade is so dominant in some of the sections within the book. And I like the fact that when you were mentioning the BRICS, uh, you also reminded us that the BRICS formation on its own is political. And you also mentioned that uh, it is likely that these countries like um, China and India, which are trading with our country, especially on, when we look at the agricultural sector, they would want a reciprocal engagement, which you say could put our country in a challenging position. Can you please explain that? I mean, right now, of course, the book I wrote it uh, earlier in the year and much of the past two years working on it. This year, I got to have a great opportunity of being chairman of the uh, agribusiness working group within the South African BRICS Business Council. And by virtue of that, I was also chairman of the global uh, agribusiness working group within the BRICS. The, some of the points that I dominated our, our conversation, for example, if you look at the 22nd of August 2023, we were talking a lot about the deepening trade so that we move beyond being on the political side and deepen the economic interests. And I think everyone that was on the BRICS uh, grouping did share the, the, the appetite um, and the appreciation for deepening of trade. So while the book had argued in that way, I think in reality, how the path has moved forward on, it is actually now in even more appreciation that we need to be deepening trade amongst um, ourselves and various other aspects that the BRICS countries um, have, have asked for. But I mean, the whole story in the book about South Africa was the fact that trade is two ways. Um, you cannot only be thinking about uh, sending exports, other people will also want to reciprocate. Um, mm -hmm. and, they, and in addition that there, you have to be thinking about what markets are you willing to open and what gaps are you willing to give to other people you've already mentioned that uh, the book has been read by people in the influential positions of, of government uh, hopefully they will be implementing some of the things now have you had anything from maybe black um farmers who have read the yeah, book? I mean, I, 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 i'm a south african agricultural economist i talk to everyone 
um, I've had conversation with black farmers, I've had conversation with white farmers, I had a conversation with large commercial farmers, I had a conversation with smallholder farmers, mm -hmm. uh, mom and pops garden farmers, I've had a conversation with, with all of those. I have conversation with the minister, with the DG and all of this, because I mean, I write in the book that mm -hmm. in the dedication that this is a book for everyone that cares about better in Africa. And I really mean that. It's not just a book for agriculturalists and those that are in agriculture. It's really a book for people that care about this country because the rural economy and the agriculture, it's part and parcel of our journey as we try to modernize and grow South Africa uh, to, be, to be better. And the view that I'm getting for most people that have read the book, um, it does really resonate with them. Um, and they do feel that we need to be implementing with this. Minister Titiza shared the same. I mean, she was at the launch of this book and made the input in Johannesburg. And uh, the Director General Ramasodi uh, of the Department of Agriculture was at the book launch that we had in Pretoria and made the support of this. And, 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 and many others that are in government uh, do share uh, this view. So my hope is that the ideas beyond the paper will actually be getting to be implemented and that more farmers and more South Africans will get to read the book, more so the fact that it's written in a narrative form, not in a dry academic way, because I'm cognizant that people are busy and they do other things and they really have uh, hopefully to, to, to enjoy the book. So uh, folks, whoever is, uh, is listening to us, you must get the book, A Country of Two Agricultures. Mm -hmm.